Welcome everyone to this afternoon's democracy seminar. It's uh, my pleasure this afternoon to in introduce uh, my good friend uh, and sometime collaborator, Bijou Rao. This uh, talk has actually uh, been delayed for about eight months. He was originally planned to, uh, scheduled to come talk last spring in March, but there was a March snowstorm which canceled all of the flights between the World Bank and, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. So he was unable to come. Uh, but we were, and then he's been uh, traveling around the country or around the world doing research between now and then. And this is the first opportunity that we've had to get him back. And so uh, we're very lucky this afternoon to have Bijou Rao, who is the lead economist in the development research group at the World Bank. Uh, Bijou holds a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania, was a postdoctoral fellow at Chicago, and then taught at the University of Michigan and Williams College before joining the bank. He serves on the editorial boards of Economic Development and Cultural Change and the Journal of Development Studies, and he combines his training in economics with an interest, unusually for a bank economist, in anthropology and social theory. He calls his approach to research, which blends economic and ethnographic methods, to study so the social and cultural dimensions of poverty, participatory econometrics. So participation is not just one of the topics of his study, but also one of the methods of his exploration. He's looked at many topics, including dowries, domestic violence, sex worker behavior, festivals, and the political economy of village democracy. He's published many books, including Culture and Public Action from Stanford, History, Historians, and Development Policy, and most recently, the book that he's going to talk about this afternoon, Localizing Development, Does Participation Work? I love Bijou's work because, uncommon for a scholar at the bank, or for that matter, uh, at research universities, he draws upon insights not just from economics, but also from politics, history, philosophy, and anthropology. In Localizing Development, for example, he shows that participation is not a new idea in Indian development, but traces its uh, circuitous intellectual thread through Gandhi, Henry Maine, and John Stuart Mill, among others. For those of you who have not yet had a chance to read it, I urge that you do so. It's available as a free download as a PDF from the World Bank site. Um, it is an important book if for no other reason than the World Bank has spent $85 billion on participatory development projects, and we ought to know something about whether when and how they work. This book teaches us much about how to think about the relationship between participation and development, especially the, the difference between what he calls induced and organic participation, the dangers of participation against the background of social and economic inequality, and the importance of state capacity and the state commitment to participatory interventions. Perhaps more than his explanation of participation, the implication and the uh, implications of his explanation for how to make, uh, excuse me, perhaps more important than his explanation of participation is his prescription and the implications of his explanation for how to make participation work. One of my favorite lines in the book comes near the end where he criticizes that the kind of deterministic social science that lays out necessary or sufficient conditions of success and or failure. In particular, he writes that the idea that communities have a stock of social capital that can readily, readily be harnessed is naive in the extreme. I won't give away any more punchlines than I have already, except to say that he is not content to see some places as ripe for participation and others as hopeless. The important question, rather, is how we can make participation work for development wherever development is needed, and that is to say, everywhere. Bijou Rao. Uh, thanks, Arkun, for the generous introduction. It's, uh, it's an honor. I'm glad it finally happened. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I look forward to speaking to you about this topic. Uh, how long do I have? Uh, well, we have till 5.30, but if you could end around 5, we're in the OK, so, so I'll, 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 I'll try to move along. Um, so uh, firstly, I think I should say this is joint work with Ghazala Mansouri, my co-author on the book. Uh, and and uh, let's just go right on to it. So as Arkon said, the, I mean, why is participation important in development? It is one of the most important modalities of development assistance, right? The World Bank alone uh, has spent, has lent 
about $85 billion uh, over the last 12 years or so uh, for participatory types of projects. Now, the World Bank is just one agency in this. You com combine it with what, say, the British government does, or USAID, or the Nordic development agencies, and you, have, you go up to the hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay? So it is a tremendously important uh, in, in development. Now, one of the things we say in this book is that when we're thinking about participatory development, we're just not thinking about what is known as community-driven development. Community-driven development is when you give money to, to, to village committees uh, directly, that they man and they manage this money to kind of do stuff within the village. Right? That's, that's kind of where you're sending money directly to communities. But we're also including in this decentralized development, which has a very different history, a very different trajectory. But when you go into sort of extreme decentralization to villages and to municipalities, uh, but then you're trying to build participatory or, or, or rely on the participation of citizens to make those governments effective, at the end, you're trying to do more or less the same thing. Uh, and even though they have different histories, at least uh, in development assistance, uh, in more recent years, they've been kind of even coming up with the same objectives. So you look at the objectives, of, you look at the project documents, that, that the design documents for these projects in the bank, and they, they kind of are driven by uh, a set of slogans rather than analysis. And what do the slogans say? What are the justifications for this? You know, we're going to do this because we want to improve accountability in the use of public funds, get part citizens involved, improve, the, improve service delivery, improve access to local public goods, uh, enhance livelihoods, empower the poor, increase social ca cohesion, build social capital, rebuild the economy, politics. I mean, the point is it's supposed to be a panacea for everything, right? Participation is thought to solve all problems in development. Now, as we know, that's not necessarily the case. And, and, and what, what, I will, what this book tries to do, I, mean, I don't think you know, we're saying anything that others haven't said. I think what we're doing that's different is putting, it, putting a lot of diverse streams of literature together, point one. But secondly, drawing on that literature to then examine the evidence. How has it actually worked around the world, this, this business of participatory development on which so much has been spent? And then learning from what that evidence tells us, what can we do to make it better in terms of policy? That is what the book is about. Yeah? So let's go to the, one of the crucial points in the book, which is what we call the difference between organic and induced participation. Okay? Now, organic participation is the stuff we know and love. Civil rights movement, any form of sort of social movement, social mobilization. Uh, even organizations like MKSP or Seva in India or the Orangi pa Project in Pakistan or many, many other wonderful NGOs that we know do wonderful work. And there's something very important to keep in mind about that kind of work. And I'm sure many people in this room have, been, be, have engaged in that kind of work. Firstly, it is very badly paid. Right? People are doing it really for, out of intrinsic motives. They're doing it because they believe it's a good thing to do, not because of the money, not because of the salary, not because it's a job. Point one. Secondly, Good NGOs, good social movements, are there for the long term. They don't sort of do their thing and walk out. They're engaged constantly over decades, sometimes over centuries, yeah, to make change happen. They kind of imagine a world that's different, that's better, and they mobilize everybody to work towards that new world. And, and, and you sort of try to persuade people, get people you know, excited about this effort, and doing it because you believe it to be true, not because somebody's paying you a salary to make it happen. Hmm? So in that long-term engagement, you're constantly open to learning from failure. You're constantly looking for chances to improve how effective you are. Any good social movement does that. Any effective social movement is constantly innovating, constantly experimenting, and constantly changing strategy depending on the political opportunities available and the social ability to mobilize people around those political opportunities. Right? That's the point of social mobilization. Social mobilization 101. Okay? What you find in development policy is that you take the principles of this kind of work, the good organic social mobilization that takes place in the development world, all over the world, people doing wonderful work on the ground, and then try to believe that your big bureaucratically run projects are going to be able to mimic the same thing. Okay? And the fundamental premise of our book is to say that that is a very different beast. And we call that induced participation, as opposed to organic participation. In other words, you know, Judith Tendler very famously called it some years ago, supply-driven, demand-driven development, right? So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. We're talking about uh, trying to, I mean, and, you know, it's necessary, don't, don't, don't get me wrong, it's important and necessary to do this, because if you don't do it in, in a large scale, you know, you, you'll end up doing boutique projects all the time. Yeah? If you want to affect real change, affect millions of people, you've got to do it in, in a large scale. 
But when you start doing it at a large scale, you're sort of changing the modality a great deal. From working with, with, you know, with a small number of intrinsically motivated people, you're working with large bureaucracies. When you're working with large bureaucracies, you're working with salaried employees. When you're working with salaried employees, you begin, quote unquote, seeing like a state. And you've got to think about everything that Jim Scott has taught us about seeing like a state to then do participation. It's a very ironic thing, right? You're seeing like a state, seeing like a bureaucracy to get people mobilized from the bottom up. Right? So that's why it's supply-driven, demand-driven development. Induced participation is terribly important because it can have wonderful impacts on a large scale, but if it is done with the bureaucratic structures that exist to do, induced, to, to, to do big development projects, we believe that there is a particular challenge in doing it that way. Right? So our book, this $85 billion I talk, spoke about, is all induced. It's all large-scale stuff done by big, big, big bureaucracies on, you know, all around the world, whether by the World Bank, funded by the World Bank or by other development agencies, or whether by large national governments. And it is both about community-driven development and about local decentralization. So that's the scope of our book, all of the above. Right? Now, a bit of very simple theory. Uh, but why, I mean, the, the kind of logic that you're trying to, 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 trying to work with here. Now, when economists think about policy of any kind, they think about policy as solving market failures. Market failures are when they're sort of, you know, uh, the, the market creates positive and negative externalities, where there are coordination problems, where the information asymmetries that create inefficiencies. Basically, the market is not functioning efficiently and therefore not providing a service that it's supposed to provide, right? When that happens, the government has to step in and fix things. Right? That's why governments step in, right? So, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a very standard diagram. I'm sure you've seen it in several classes over your lives. But, 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 but the point is that m market failure is what drives the state to come in. Now, as we've been discovering over the last several decades, governments are not efficient either. Governments are also subject to huge coordination problems, poor institutions, and information asymmetries. Right? And what's, what's the unique thing, interesting thing about market failure? Market failure seems to screw the poor more than it does the rich. The rich tend to benefit from market failures. They're able to exploit the system more than the poor are. The poor get screwed because then they don't get good schools, good clinics, they don't get credit, all kinds of bad stuff happens. The same thing happens to government failure. Government failure, the, the burdens of government failure are inordinately borne by the poor. It's highly correlated with inequality, right? So the problem of development is often seen as an interaction between market failure and state failure. When markets and states fail, what do you do? So if you look at the history of this stuff, participatory development, it was providing a third solution. Markets fail, governments fail, let's go to citizens. Okay? So let's go to citizens and have citizens solve these problems by holding states accountable, whether the local state or the high level state, and, 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 and solving the problem of market failure. Say the Grameen Bank is an example of that, right? using civil society to solve a market failure problem. Right? Now, just a bit of sort of history on this. There was a wave of community participation back in the 50s, right after World War II when development first came in to being large-scale development after, after the, uh, in the beginning of the post-colonial period, when all those independent movements were sort of creating independent countries, USAID, the World Bank, other agencies started working a lot, building on cooperative movements. Right? So, so you had all these, in India, for instance, had the Indian independence movement led by Gandhi, which, re which resulted in enormous interest in cooperative development. Cooperative development was funded by the Ford Foundation in India, as the dissertation at Berkeley has demonstrated, uh, that led to a huge effort to, to, to work with uh, local communities for development purposes. Similarly, funding village governments, municipal governments, a, a belief in decentralization. In, in the post-World -World War II period, there was a huge wave of this stuff in the 50s and 60s. It disappeared. Why? Because people like me said, it's all subject to elite capture and horrible stuff. So it was, it was killed, essentially. It died. Right? The baby was thrown out with the bathwater, bath essentially. So when it disappeared, what happened was you had a reversal and a, and a great belief in state-led development, in top-down development. Right? Uh, uh, you know, there was, of course, a, a counter-critique to this with Hirschman and others writing about the importance of participation. Uh, then, of course, Paulo Freire, a whole bunch of people all over the world writing against this stuff, trying to change thinking. And, of course, Sen comes along and talks about development as freedom. That, along with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, the, the reform RC period in, in Indonesia, other countries that turned democratic, started and of course, structural adjustment, started turning people's interests again from top down to bottom up. The critique of development that you might, you, I'm sure you know about. 
That critique of development resulted in a movement again towards bottom-up development in the 90s. Right? So this is kind of the second wave of this thing. Right? Now, 20 years later after this wave, it's time to look at the evidence. Right? One of our fears in writing this book is that this book with others like it would result in a killing of the baby, throwing of the baby at the bathwater again, that we, would, that we would end this. And that is the last thing we want. Both Ghazala and I have histories in the participatory movement. Uh, Ghazala was a pro-democracy activist in Pakistan in her youth. I worked with them in self-help groups you know, in my 20s. I mean, I, I, all my life, I've worked in participation issues. I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe in this stuff. Right? We are great believers in participation. It is because of that that we are trying to look at it critically and ask how we can do it better. So we start with the question, does participation work? Question mark. But then let's see what the answers are. Right? OK. So the problem with this triangle, of course, is that there's market failure and state failure. You can't imagine and assume that civil society or communities are going to work efficiently all the time. The standard problems of collective action are going to apply. And a standard problem of collective action that Mansour Olson wrote about a long time ago is essentially a coordination problem. Right? So they have coordination problems in communities, not just in getting communities to get their act together internally, but also in how they link to states and markets. Yeah? Now, that coordination problem is also deeply affected by inequality. Who runs unequal communities? Well, the rich run unequal communities, both because the rich are natural readers, because they are, tend to be better educated, but also because they tend to like to dominate things. <laughs> this is sort of well-known stuff. So it is crazy to think that if you have market failure and government failure, that you do not have something called civil society failure. That is an analog to government failure and market failure. Right? So just as we think about a lot of development policy as policy that is meant to address market failures and government failures, we need to think about policy in the participatory field as policies to address civil society failure of different kinds around the world. Not as an attempt, as most of the literature talks about it, at least the policy literature, an attempt to quote unquote harness social capital. That social capital business has been the single most destructive thing in this field, right? Because it has not taken the complexity of community seriously and assumed there is an untapped capacity there that we can easily tap. It's been tremendously, I think, ineffective because of, because of, that, because of poor conceptualization more than anything else. Yeah? So, one of our tap attempts is to, is to provide a little more conceptual conception on that. All right. So I've talked about what civil society failure is. And the, and the basic point here, we can get into this in, 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 in some detail later, is that civil society failure, again, is highly correlated with inequality and screws the poor more than it does the rich, just as market failure does and government failure does. And it basically is the inability of communities to act efficiently. And of course, every village is going to be different. Some villages are going to act, have less of it. Some villages are going to have much more of it and you're going to have a whole distribution. And you have to really understand what the capacity is of communities to deal, to, 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 to act collectively, to mobilize collectively, to work against cut up state government officials, for instance, before you think about policy. Right? Now, that's one challenge, is the challenge of addressing the problem of civil society failure in, 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 the, in the induced space. Keep that in mind. We're talking about induced development. I'm not talking about organic development here. I'm not talking about organic policy. I'm talking about induced policy, civil society failure. The third point is what we call uncertain trajectories of change. Right? Now, what do we mean by this? If, now, we've looked at every design document, what in the World Bank are called PADS, uh, 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 the project appraisal documents. These are the design documents of, government, of, of World Bank projects. We've looked at every one in, in, of, of that, that's been done for a participatory project over the last 10 years. We looked at 350 of these documents. I can assure you it wasn't fun reading. <laughs> yeah? uh, Yes, if you, if you, if you ever you know, have trouble falling asleep, you should download those things. Now, what they often say, and, and I'm, just, I'm not making up language here, is something along these lines, that you know, we will, in, they usually have three to five year horizons. Okay? And in those three to five years, they say, we will invest in social capital, I'm paraphrasing, we'll invest in social capital, build communities, mobilize communities, so that you know, they will, we will improve the quality of social capital and, so, and their capacity for collective action. Okay? And immediately, as this happens, wonderful things will start happening. We'll reduce poverty. We will, we will transform schools. We will improve the functioning of government. So in five years, I mean, the projects that have actually stated this, we will reduce poverty by 20% in five years, which, by the way, would be the largest poverty reduction in human history. Right? And they get away with this stuff. They get away with this stuff. 
right? So, $85 million with that kind of theory. Now, what's the reality? Again, nothing new here, but think about the reality. The reality is an uncertain trajectory of change. Let me just, one example of that trajectory of change is sort of, it's more like a punctuated equilibrium more than anything else, is that when you start trying to mobilize communities, and think about village communities here, this is all local stuff, you're trying to mobilize communities, for a long time, nothing's gonna happen. You start getting people together, starting to act in concert, you sort of, you know, they, they, I don't like that guy, I'm not gonna, I mean, we all belong to communities, right? We belong to condo communities, we belong to departmental communities, a lot of them. And we have trouble coming to collective action solutions, right? Same thing happens in villages as well. For a long time, nothing may happen, even if you keep mobilizing and putting a lot of time to mobilizing them. And after some time, maybe something starts happening. Maybe they start working better together. Right? Some villages are going to do it very efficiently. Maybe some villages actually do it like this. But others are going to do it like that. Others are going to do it like that. Every village is going to be different. Once that happens, maybe after some time, you will start seeing an impact on welfare. Maybe after some time, you'll start seeing better schools, better governments, once they're able to mobilize properly. But what that time period is, nobody can say for sure. We know it's going to take time. And we know context is going to be all matter a great deal. Every village is going to be different. Not just every village, every country is going to be different. So any design of such a project has to be extremely, extremely uh, uh, concerned about contextual variation and what to do about it and how to design around it and also extremely aware of uncertain trajectories of change. This is not like building a bridge, right? Now, you know, one, of the, one of the interesting things about development agencies, the World Bank certainly, it's much more, it's, I mean, what is the history of the World Bank? The history of the World Bank is that it is, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, came out of World War II for post-war reconstruction, right? So as an institutional structure, it is structured towards reconstruction. Reconstruction literally means construction of stuff. <laughs> building bridges, rebuilding roads, building dams. Where a three to five year project cycle makes perfect sense. An engineer can come in and tell you that's what we need to do. We can get the cement and the bricks together and design it. An architect comes in, tells you how to do it. An engineer works it out and you do it. And of course, the implementation issues, but that's another story. The point is that these are, these are very predictable things to do. And with predictable impacts. You build a bridge, good things will happen. Yeah? You build a road, good things will happen. Communities are not the same thing as bridges or roads. There has to be a different way of thinking about how to do this right, right? And it's not just the World Bank here, it's every development agency has this way of thinking. So, again, what are our tools of thinking through the literature? One is induced versus organic, the idea of civil society failure, and uncertain trajectories of change, and the way development assistance works in that period, right? Seeing like a state. So, with all of that, let's now ask and get to the data and ask some questions. What do the data tell us about what, how these projects have worked? What does the impact have been? So we're asking a variety of different questions, very key questions, we think, and questions that we draw from the design documents. This is what the design documents say these projects will do. Does participation benefit poor people? Does it improve local infrastructure? Does it improve access to and quality of public services? Does it reduce poverty, increase assets, expand livelihood opportunities? Does participation improve accountability? Are investments better aligned with local preferences? The whole point of accountability. Are resources better targeted? Is there less capture and corruption? Are communities, and especially the poor, better able to observe, monitor, and sanction service providers? Are service providers more responsive to communities? Does participation increase civic capacity? Does it enhance inclusion and voice and agency? Does it improve social cohesion or the ability to act collectively, the capacity for collective action? Very, very basic questions, and there's some others we look at the book. Now, the second thing about the kind of nature of the evidence we look at. Remember, we're looking at big projects. We're looking at large-scale projects that are attempting to target literally millions of people at a time. When you're looking at projects of that size, you cannot just look at case studies, right? Case study evidence is tremendously insightful. I've done a bunch of case studies myself, and they're all about process, and we learn from the, 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 what case studies teach us about process and theory a lot in our book. But in looking at the evidence of efficacy, we have to look at large survey-based evidence. There's no way around it because it has to be representative of a large project. So a lot of our evidence comes from econometric evidence, and not just RCTs. RCTs are a big part of our evidence, but anywhere where there is a credible counterfactual and there's credible uh, design in order to assess the causal impact of the project. That's where our evidence is coming from. So what does the evidence tell us? Does participation benefit the poor? Well, firstly, are resources better targeted? Now, this is the interesting thing. It's mildly, targeting towards the poor is mildly better overall, but it's much better for health and schooling. 
participation seems to work particularly well in health and schooling, as opposed to everything else. Right? So keep that in mind. We'll come to ask, ask, ask why that's the case in a minute. Secondly, shouldn't be a surprise, capture, elite capture, is more likely in unequal communities that are more remote and less literate. And this is going to be a recurring theme. The role of low literacy, the role of inequality, the role of remoteness. Again, a version of inequality, unequal geography, if you wish. Yeah? That matters a great deal in doing induced participatory development. It's a lot harder when you have these conditions, which is basically conditions that prevail in most developing countries. Poverty and livelihoods. Does it improve incomes? Now, here the results are mixed, primarily because there's not enough evidence. But what evidence is there is not very happy. Right? We don't find huge impacts on income. So it's not really a tool for poverty reduction like it is sold to be, but there's a lot of room for doing more research on this. We, we don't know yet. Public services. Community participation alone does not work. It's uh, beneficial when there are other inputs. I mean, I mean this is, should be a surprise. Just having participation doesn't matter if the, the, the government is not cooperating with those communities to make services better. Right? So you need a collaboration between participatory bottom up and top down. Right? And you see that theme emerging again and again in our, in our evidence. Secondly, on public services, the gains are larger under democratic decentralization. Right? And some countries have that, Brazil, India, some other countries. When you have democratic decentralization, when local village governments and municipal governments are democratically elected in credible elections, you have better results, right? generally speaking. Uh, thirdly, Programs that increase the fiscal burdens of local governments under decentralization can worsen public service delivery. What do we mean by this? You know, one of the problems with uh, policy in this area and, and, uh, is that the theory of public finance that is generally applied is the theory of public finance that comes from Musgrove and Oates and, and you know, Thibault uh, and a whole bunch of folks who were writing in the 50s and 60s about the United States of America right? and devising theories around that. In other words, they're not looking at issues of inequality. They're not looking at issues of asymmetric information. They're not looking at issues of elite domination. They're not looking at issues of corruption. They're looking at rather smoothly functioning local governments. And then, you know, good things happen. People vote with their feet. Yes, we can have increased the, you know, the, the big prediction from that is, of course, an effective local government is one that can raise its own revenues rather than have money pushed in from outside. That's a, that's a big result. Development policy has been driven even to this day, I see projects like this, by this kind of thinking. Now, there's a critique of this by Pranab Bardhan, Dilip Mukherjee, a whole bunch of wonderful scholars who've been criticizing this. But policy, in fact, is not listening to that critique very much. And in fact, you find policies that keep saying you have to generate local revenues. In order, that's, 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 the, that's a good local government that is able to generate its own revenues rather than provide those revenues from the outside. Therefore, you inc and, and give them a whole bunch of stuff to do that they don't have money for. You're increasing their fiscal burden without Providing for it, yeah? unfunded mandates. This, we find, tends to worsen public service delivery. Not a surprise. A lot of our empirical results, even though we're drawing from this very large literature, we looked at about 500 pieces of empirical work to, to draw these results. It's, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a huge literature review. I think, I think I'm right when I say it's, a, it's the largest, most comprehensive literature review to, on, this, on this subject to date. Uh, but the results are not very surprising. Okay? Accountability and civic capacity. It's not at all clear that moving to the local level reduces capture and corruption. In some ways, it decentralizes corruption. That doesn't mean that the, the decentralized corruption is worse or better than central corruption. It's just don't think that that's the answer. Yeah? Um, now, and the reasons for this is community capacity to monitor and enforce is quite limited. Uh, again, Capture is more likely in communities that are unequal, remote, poor, and less. The role of inequality comes in again and again and again. Inequality and low literacy. But, but, a few results, econometric results that are very interesting, a lot of work to be done here, right, that find that even if the actual outcome was no different, just by consulting people, you make them feel happier. They feel like they're involved in the process. It has intrinsic value. And, and that's more work, is written, but it's really interesting there. And finally, um, Bottom-up efforts need to be complemented by top-down efforts. Right? The role of uh, randomized audits, the role of providing information, combined with bottom-up efforts, right? seem, to be, seem to be more effective than just doing the bottom-up alone. On civic capacity, there is actually very, 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 very little evidence. 
And we can ask why there is very little evidence. Not because there's not been a lot of research. A lot of people have tried to find this stuff. That participatory development builds civic capacity. The biggest selling point of these things was investing in social capital. We find, no, there's not much stuff that comes out of there. Right? Now, you could argue that's because we don't know how to measure social capital. But you know, a lot of smart people have given 20 years of thought to this subject, and we're not finding outcomes. And I think a lot more work can be done there. Bottom line is, at the moment, there's very little evidence that that's happening. Okay? In fact, participants tend to be wealthier. They tend to be more male, more likely to be male. They tend to be better educated. They tend to be more politically connected than non-participants. Who actually participates in these communities? It is the richer, the wealthier, and, 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 and often male. Yeah? Now, there is encouraging evidence from participatory councils under decentralization, the Gram Sabhas in India, for instance, where you find that that open space of deliberation, when it is, when it is, you know, is a credible space, does increase the capacity of the poor to have voice. Right? So you do find that result. There's also encouraging results, which you're probably familiar with, which shows that mandated reservations, when you, when you sort of mandate that in all these committees, uh, say uh, one third of seats are going to be reserved for women or a certain percentage for disadvantaged groups, that seems to increase the ability of groups to, to take resources to their side. Right? So, so mandated reservations does seem to counteract the effects of inequality. Yeah? So um, just moving along, summarizing the evidence, the outcomes, and it should be pretty clear, tend to be better when there is a supportive state structure and well-capacitated implementing agencies. In other words, participatory development is not a substitute for an ineffective state. It requires an effective state to be effective. So, and which, which sort of is not the logic that's applied for many of these projects. You want to take them to post-conflict areas because the state doesn't exist. Be careful, is what we say. Okay? Uh, Secondly, participatory projects are better when they're implemented by elected local governments. Elected local governments. Or closely aligned to those elected local governments. When participatory institutions have teeth. Now, why do they, do they not have teeth? Because they, oftentimes what happens is these are three to five year project cycles. There are ad hoc committees created to spend money that the, that the project has given them over three to five years. Now think of what happens. You have a village. Some guy from outside comes, comes to the village and says, I want to form a committee. Uh, try to elect this committee in the best way that you know who are the good people who can serve in this committee. I'm going to give you $20,000 that you've got to spend in three years and do what you want with. And you know, we're going to build these participatory change. What's going to happen? Is anybody going to go there to really participate? No. It's going to attract those who are the best able to take that money towards their own interests. And that's what you see in the data. Mandates on inclusion that I already talked about are effective. Generally speaking, though of course, you know, there's some debate on that. And of course, information is always better. Right? So when you have more information, it's always a better thing. Uh, certainly doesn't hurt. Right? Outcomes tend to be worse when communities are poorer, more remote, more unequal, less literate, and then there's, less, there's little local management capacity. The reason we're coming up with this point again and again is because it's a recurring theme in the entire literature. As I said, 500 papers that we looked at, this is a recurring theme in almost every paper. Okay? And this is all independent stuff done on a variety of different stuff in a variety of different countries. Right? And finally, this is the point that perhaps uh, I mean, it requires a bit of background. Again, this business of, of local participation. When you look at participatory projects and look at how they're designed, they often say that they have to have ownership. What does that mean? Local communities have to provide labor or have to provide money or have to provide some form of, 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 of their voluntary time to co-finance those public goods. Now, uh, a country like Indonesia, for instance, 40% uh, approximately of, of school budgets at the village level are funded by communities. The communities give that money. Yeah? It's a form of you know, voluntary taxation, if you wish. It's not mandated. But that's because Indonesia has a long history since independence in 1948 of this idea of gotong royong. You get folks to think that way. They change how you're educated. The idea of citizenship, commun communitarian citizenship, is a part of the national identity. That's how people are educated. That's how they're trained. So it's not surprising that will happen. You go to India, about 2% of people in villages pay their taxes. People are constantly reneging on their taxes. And nobody can enforce this, because they don't have that culture. right? So what is sort of interesting is when you insist that because this stuff worked in Indonesia, we're going to take it to every other country in the world, which you often see the World Bank. Indonesia drives everything, right? You find that outcomes are worse. It's like Corvée labor. You're forcing for poor folks 
I mean, it's a form of regressive, it's not just regressive taxation. I don't know what the word is. Regressive taxation is when the poor are paying a proportionately a high proportion of you know, the taxes than the rich. But this is no, this is absolute amounts, not proportions, right? You're financing public goods on the backs of the poor. There's something quite wrong about that. And that's what we find. OK, so what are the lessons for donors? Now, all donors, my organization included, uh, need, to need to change this path-dependent institutional structure that continues to derive from a focus on capital-intensive development and reconstruction. They need to figure out how to do this new kind of development differently. It's terribly important to do it, but they need to rethink how to do it. And thankfully, the bank is going through a period of reorganization where the goal is to move in that direction. We'll see if it happens, but that's the goal. Okay? Repairing civil society and political failures is a much harder task. Now, talking to a bunch of people at the Ash Center for Democracy, I don't think that's a surprising statement. Now, finally, the variability of local context and the unpredictable nature of change trajectories, which I talked about, highlight the, the terrible importance of developing effective systems of learning by doing. Because you don't know what's going to happen, you've got to constantly experiment just like organic participation does. But you've got to do it at scale. You have to use technologies and systems that allow you to learn by doing at scale, which is not a boutique kind of thing where you, you know, for instance, I'll never forget this thing that happened recently to me last year. I went to the head of a major Indian participatory project and I sort of said, you know, we need to have these monitoring systems to learn how you're doing. He says, I don't believe in all this stuff. I believe in my gut feeling. And he had a very big gut. Yeah? <laughs> so, I shouldn't talk. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 the thing is, you know, this idea that you can go to a village and it's your, your, your sort of your on the ground sensation by going to that village is going to tell you everything about a $5 billion project is a little weird. You're talking about affecting 250 million women, you can't do that by going to you know, a village a month even. Hmm? It needs a much bigger sample than that. That idea of using the idea of sampling theory to understand that you need a bigger sample to have some representativeness and have enough statistical power to make a valid statement has not caught in into people's heads. Yeah? And it requires experimentation. A tool that works one place is not going to work another place. Every village may require a different method of intervention. And when every village is different, it requires a lot of experimentation. Right? So how does the bank do on these attributes? Monitoring and evaluation, learning by doing, path dependency, and so on and so forth. What do we find? Context, learning from context. As I said, we looked at every project design document that the bank has done on this kind of project over the last 10 years, 12 years. 350 of these, a poor research assistant of mine, spent two years looking at this stuff. Okay? And I, 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 man, she, she, she needed a lot of coffee. Let's just leave it at that. Okay? What did we find? Firstly, only 40% of them pay any attention to monitoring systems at all. And of those 40%, about a third actually have an effective monitoring system. Right? So about 12% have an effective, reasonably effective monitoring system that you know, one, can talk, one can talk about. But secondly, you read these pads, cut and paste, cut and paste, cut and paste. Talk about paying attention to context? No, they're paying attention to the word cut and paste function. Right? That's not paying attention to context. Now, then we surveyed, okay, then you know, people said pads are, you know, these are design documents, that's you know, textual analysis. That's not how we actually do things in the field. Okay, so we surveyed managers of these projects. And it was you know, pretty good response rate. We sent it to every manager of these kinds of projects. We got a third of them to reply, which you know, for an for a, you know, email-based survey is extremely high, I think. What do we find? Basic point, the bank's operations policies do not provide adequate incentives for monitoring and evaluation and have very inadequate supervision budgets. The incentives within the organization don't allow for it. That the bank is trying to change, I understand. It is not perceived to be the priority of senior management. And monitoring evaluation are seen as a box to be checked uh, to obtain a loan rather than as an instrument for effective decision making. And this is the thing. Even if a monitoring system is in place, it is largely in place for the project manager, the bank, to come and see whether there's a monitoring system rather than as what I, we call a decision support system. Monitoring data to be used by the project to make this everyday decisions. That you don't see much of. Don't see at all, in fact. Standard duration of projects, an average of five and a half years, including of renewals. Some of these projects get renewed, but the average is five and a half years. This doesn't allow enough time to realize participatory objectives. The time horizon is too short. Um, so, you know, and so the adaptability of context is pretty much non-existent. No, I mean, none of these, when these projects are designed, it's not like they're talking to anthropologists, with some exceptions. KDP, which if you're an MPID student, I'm sure you've heard about again and again, is the exception. Okay? 
uh, that's not the rule. Uh, that is the exception. Where there was an enormous amount of attention paid to these things, to understanding the sociology of projects, you know, how the projects varied, that is not the case in the vast majority of these projects. There's very little contextual understanding. Right? So what is the bottom line? Well, patience is the virtue. <laughs> You know, it's not something you can do quickly in three to five year project cycles. You have to have a long term horizon for these things. Project structures need to allow for lo flexible long term engagement. And, you know, again, I'm not saying things that anybody in this room would find surprising. Project design sh needs to allow for political and social analysis. How many of you know, I mean, you might know one or two because they teach at the Kennedy School, but how many of you actually know, on average, a political scientist or sociologist actually doing political science or sociology in the World Bank? Very, very few. Right? Because they're not used. Monitoring systems, the non-existence of monitoring systems, there has to change. And the idea of a sandwich this is something that Jonathan Fox came up with many years ago. It's a very, very important. Archon's work has demonstrated this again and again. I mean, everybody who looks at this subject seriously finds the same thing. We find the same thing. The idea of a sandwich. The top has to meet the bottom. If the top, the center, is not actively supportive of participation, it's not going to work in, in, the, in the induced sense. Now, an NGO, an activist, maybe oh, it's a different story. That, that in fact, they're acting. Th let me give you an example. I mean, there's some work that I did in India that did this. Think about what's going on here. So let me give you this example. And sort of, it's, you see this everywhere. We were trying to have, uh, uh, to, to, to randomize on participatory engagement, teach, village gov teach citizens in villages how to engage with village governments, right? But the way it was designed, we didn't, get the support of the high-level bureaucrats to make sure that this happened, right? So what basically happened was <laughs> these citizens were getting activated, and they were getting beaten up in the process. So the few village activists who were brave enough to say anything about corrupt local village politicians were beaten up by the village politicians, and their family said, you're, I'm damned if you're going to do this. One guy was kicked out of, by, out of his house by his wife because he said, I don't want you as an activist. I get into trouble, right? So they don't do it. I mean, think about the yeah, irony of this. You're trying to use agents of the government, because they're doing induced participation in large bureaucracies, to get citizens to activate themselves against whom? The same agents of government. There's an inherent irony in this that people seem to have, don't seem to have gotten onto. Okay? So you need that sandwich. You need the bottom-up force, those citizens, those poor activists, to be supported by somebody higher up than the local agents of the state they're acting against. Right? That sandwich becomes very important. Facilitators. At the end, all of this, I mean, again, Jude Tendler's work is classic here. Who works on these projects? It's the lowest paid functionary of these projects, the facilitator. This person is usually barely, maybe a high school educator probably, makes nothing. Okay, but they're not intrinsically motivated. For them, this is a good job, right? But they, they're the lowest paid people in the, and they're supposed to be activists, survey designers. Uh, implementers, anthropologists, uh, you know, econo economic, economic anal uh, and analysts. Uh, they're supposed to be like these multifaceted development workers and supposed to create mobilization and change all on their heads. Poorly incentivized, poorly paid. And actually a big research topic because we know very little about these guys and how they actually function. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, a tolerance for honest feedback and failure. Now, learn from failure and success. I mean, it's, it's something that should be such an obvious message. Finally, the bank is beginning to talk about it after our book came out. I'm not necessarily saying there's a causal connection, but it's true. This idea of allowing mess to be revealed. Development is a messy process. When you have that triangle and everything failing, it, things are not going to happen in neat boxes. To learn from that mess is the point. Are you able to observe that mess and adapt accordingly? That's the crucial thing. But when you get slammed for saying anything critical, you become so scared that nobody says anything critical. The entire, I mean, you know, David Moss, who's a wonderful anthropologist at SOAS in London, uh, did a study where he found, and, and I'm, I'm maybe not very sure with these numbers, but something like 30 to 40% of the project's budget was spent on advocacy. What is advocacy? Making stuff up. That's what it is. Publicity. Okay? You're polishing up the project. Boot polish is what I call it. Right? Constantly, that's what development work is about. If, if you join a development agency, you'll be spending a lot of time doing that. Right? That culture needs to change into actually observing and learning from what's actually going on on the ground. Right? So let me stop there since I'm out of time, just about, and encourage you to download the book, as Arkon said, and, 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 and uh, you know, that, that, would be, that would be worth the effort. Thank you. Uh, 
Shall I do it? Okay. Okay. We have a good amount of time, about 30 minutes for questions on a very rich presentation, both conceptually, empirically, and then also operationally. Yes? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, 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 that's, that's, uh, that's a much, that's different literature, right? I mean, that's not necessarily a participatory literature. So, so I'm going to def okay. uh, defect that question instead of, you know, deflect that question. Yeah, at the back there. So on the first thing, I'm not saying social capital is, I'm skeptical of social capital. I'm saying it's a, it's a terribly conceptualized concept on which there's a huge literature that's far better conceptualized. And I don't know why we don't read that literature instead of reading this literature on what we call social capital. I don't see what's the added value of social capital. Let's read the literature on collective action. Let's read Ostrom. Let's read Olson. Let's read Judith Tendler. Let's read Archon. Let's read Jen, Jenny Mansbridge. I mean, lots of people have written good stuff on this. Why should we read the social capital literature? Because it gives us bad policy. Because it makes it seem so simple. Take that contrast in India and Indonesia. That's a very, it's, I've written on that. It, I, I call it symbolic public goods, right? I say the state has developed something called symbolic public goods via an education system. Yes, it, is, it creates civic capacity. I'm not, I've got nothing against civic capacity. It's a very important concept or agency. It's how you conceptualize it, right? And to me, social capital gives, a, gives us a very weak conceptualization. That's just my view, right? On the second point, there you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, you know so strong, Civic capacity often exists in states that have strong states, right? Uh, and, and that's one of the challenges of development: is, is how do you how do you function in a space where nothing works? Uh, that's the big challenge. Uh, and our answer to that challenge is: go slowly, be patient, experiment. Don't think you know what you're doing because you don't. Don't think that because it worked in one country, it's going to work here. Please understand the local politics, the local anthropology, local cultural systems, local political social. Understand how all this works before you start sequentially trying to do stuff, right? Don't rush uh, into in, 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 in just throwing money away. That, that, that would be a perspective. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, well, what you have explained, it's, to me, it sounds too good to be true. I come from Indonesia, and although Sri Mulyani from Indonesia, being the managing director of the World Bank, but there have been a lot of suspicion Toward the world, uh, world Bank in Indonesia. We are experiencing intensive and extensive decentralizations. Not all of them ready yet. And civil society is not present in, al in almost everyone, especially outside of Java. I'm all for participation, organic and in induced participations. But again, without civil society, with all the suspicion, toward the World Bank. How could you overcome that? How could you be effective in that kind of situation? Now, I'm not going to get into trouble by answering that question. Uh, but, the, but the thing is this, right? I mean, you make a very good point. Civil society is not one thing. You know, it operates at different levels. You have civil society active at the national level, at the state level, at the province level, and at the village level. Right? The only claim I'm making from our data is that Indonesia at least up to the point when we collected the data, which was around 2004, had very active community-based organizations from a long history going back to Sukarno. In fact, going back to the Dutch, right? Uh, which, which spent a lot of time building that sort of activism, right? And so, so, so at the village level, it wasn't civic activism in the sense of, let's fight the government. It was civic activism in the sense of, let's get together to build a school, right? That seemed to work pretty well. That's the only claim I'm making. Yeah? Uh, on the rest of it, I will, I will uh, you know, let others answer that question. Yes. It's from the Kennedy School Criminal Justice Program. I was very fascinated by your discussion of just capture and elite capture. 
I wondered, based on my experience doing a survey in Jamaica where we saw this community intervention program, large scale, um, be very successful. Sorry? JSIF? Which program? Oh, not JSIF, okay. uh, CSJP. Okay. So uh, we saw where it was very much supported by the communities it was in. 90% um, satisfaction, but only about 15% of community members knew about the program. Right? So it was really a situation of certainly some amount of elite capture. The challenge, though, is in providing that report, the respective organizations, the donors, they wanted to hold on to the 90% as opposed to the 15%. And it's really, a, I think it goes back to your point, right, of the irony of it all, that oftentimes persons will want to hold on to the good news as opposed to dealing with some of the other issues. How do you build up that monitoring capacity that you spoke of that and sometimes um, these donor agencies shirk from? Uh, I think changing incentives. You know, so I've been giving this talk to a lot of donor agencies, particularly when you talk to bilaterals. You know, they tell you, look, our taxpayers expect quick results, because that's what gives us support for 0.1% one, one of, of GDP to go into development, which is, in the European Union, kind of the standard 0.07% really. You know, how do we maintain that level of support from the public if we don't keep giving them good news, you know, so then that those incentives then percolate down to the lowest level, you know, and and so, so the only answer is educate your public. If they want to be engaged in development. It's not going to happen so magically, yeah. And similar pressures hold for every development agency. So I, I don't, I mean, I don't think it's about individuals. It's about institutional systems, and changing the incentives for institutional systems. I think how you do that is by writing books like ours and talking about this stuff and sort of saying, look, you're messing up, we think. We can do, let's, not, let's not use the word messing up. I don't think they're messing up. You know, our results are mixed. There's good and bad, right? But you could do a lot better by simply re recognizing reality for what it is and allowing managers, incentivizing them to report the bad stuff <laughs> along with the good and not punishing. So you should be rewarded for having a good monitoring system that is, gives you accurate data. And if a monitoring system just gives you good news all the time, you know it's a bad monitoring system, right? That kind of stuff has to change. Uh, you know, and we'll see where it goes. I mean, I'm, I'm at this point quite optimistic that we are moving towards a regime of that kind, but we'll know more in five years. Peter. The implication of uh, Peter Hall from uh, the government department, is the implication of your point about context uh, that uh, these kinds of projects are gonna work best where there already is some uh, relatively robust uh, civil society, some set of uh, organizations or alternatively networks of activists so that uh, would you draw this conclusion that uh, you know building from zero is um, very likely to uh, result in failure even though in those circumstances you might think the returns are higher because uh, any gain is a gain uh, uh, would you go so far as to draw the conclusion that uh, this kind of project in fact projects per specifically designed to enhance uh, participation in some durable way uh, actually uh, will work best where there already is uh, uh, significant participation. And, and I guess the other question, which you may or may not be able to answer, depends on the methods. Um, do you have any success cases to tell us about? Right. Uh, thanks for both those questions. I mean, so, 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 the, so the, the fact is yes, that it's much easier to do this stuff when you have a relatively effective state, which often goes along with a relatively effective, a relatively effective civic capacity. That, that's, that's, that's true. But as you said, the gains are a lot higher when you're in a lot worse situation, right, potentially. And we're not saying it's impossible. We're saying it's a lot harder and a lot more uncertain. And we need to recognize the fact that it's a lot harder and a lot more uncertain in how we design and track these projects. That's the point we're making. Don't, it's not don't do it, but do it very differently. Uh, and don't think that because it worked in a country which had high civic capacity, it's going to work in a country without that high civic capacity. You've got to look at different things. For instance, you know, uh, 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 there's been some very interesting work uh, looking at radio programs in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and, and the Congo and other places and trying to see how effective those are. Trying to get participation to move in ways that don't involve social mobilization. Right? I mean, so th there may be other ways of doing it. We need, it needs an enormous amount of, of, of a different way of thinking. That's, that's the only point we're making. Um, so. Better. We've got to take context more into account. We've got to, um, you know, 
monitor it better. And th those are all very sensible things. Uh, I'm just trying deliberately to give you trouble. And, but I think, and I'm not saying this entirely artificially, that the burden of your results as reported here suggests to me that we should not be using honey. I, I, so the question is, what is this? Right? So, so there are many, many ways of doing participatory projects. I mean, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. It's a hell of a lot easier, no question. But what do we mean by participation? So for instance, one could try to be building basic capacity to manage public goods in conjunction with building sustainable local governments in countries that don't have them. Right? So you have an agreement, for instance, that we're going to have elected local governments and build deliberative institutions alongside these local governments that over the long term will see some change, knowing that the first 10 years may see nothing. So, so long as you're willing to have that long-term trajectory because you're starting from scratch and you're able to facilitate that level of change, then I think you're on the right path. I'm not saying you're going to get quick results, but you're on the right path. So that's why I said I don't think it's, it, it, the answer is all hopeless. I think it's doing things radically differently, and that's not going on right now for the most part. Yeah. yeah. My name's Nick. I'm from HKS, uh, the, the MPP program. Did you, in your literature or in your research, did you find any difference in the, I know the World Bank at one time had a global program on output-based aid, um, which was basically instead of providing all everything up front, it sort of was, was uh, over time. Did you find any difference in the participation of the citizens when you didn't sort of give everything up front? What do you mean by give everything up front? I guess instead of giving the, uh, the whole loan uh, up front, you sort of, stretch it out over time and based on, you know, once you hit targets or once you hit milestones, you hit more. Yeah. Um, so so um, well, there's a lot of such programs. They've not been well evaluated, right? So, so I, I, if anything I would say would be anecdotal and speculative. Uh, but it's certainly a promising area of research. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we would say that one has to test out a little bit more. Yeah, Arkon. places where they have to <coughs> do less inducing, that is where many of the other pieces are already in place, like maybe there's a bunch of demand going on already, and there's even a state that wants to do it, but all the state needs is some money to do it, or maybe the state is reluctant, or maybe the state is divided, and some state actors really want to do it, but some are reluctant, and the development agency could tip the balance one way or another, and, uh, as opposed to the kind of induced program which is, you know, a whole box project that the bank or USAID or just it rolls out and you take it or leave it. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. It goes back to a question which I didn't answer on successful projects. So, you know, the point is that induce and organic are sort of ideal types, sure. right? And ideally what you want to do is to have the induce build on the organic or interact somehow, support the process of organic. Go back to Peter's question as well, right? So let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, uh, a project I'm involved with now, which is basically on women's self-help groups in India, uh, supposed to affect at the end 250 million women. This is building on 25, 30 years of effort in building women's self-help groups in India. So it makes sense for the bank to come and say, OK, you've done this in various places. Let's try to scale it up now. Uh, it's an organic part. We build, it's completely organic. Let's try to scale it up. Similarly, the Indian panchayat system, right? Constitutional Amendment, 1992, uh, the 73rd Amendment, that, that says institutes regular elections every six years, that institutes a deliberative body. It makes sense for a development agency, let's build on this capacity. Let's build on this institution that's going nowhere. These institutions have teeth because they've been constitutionally empowered. Let's build on that. Now, what has also happened is development projects have, in fact, not done that. They've had these induced projects trying to build parallel organizations to the panchayats, and therefore not and because they say that's more efficient, panchayats are a lost case, you know, they're so inefficient. Let's build these parallel organizations that we're going to control, they're going to be more efficient. That, but that's, in the long term, that's precisely the kind of thing you do not want to do. That's, that's totally crazy induced, right? Uh, uh, Indonesia KDP, which did, uh, started its design 
by doing these uh, surveys of, of understanding the nature of so, civic capacity in, in, in the villages, in, in, in Indonesian uh, uh, villages, and then building on, on that basis. You know, so try and discovered all the civic capacities, let's build on that. So, but then saying that, look, uh, over time, they sort of said that, look, what we need to do is build the capacity of local governments, not just build these organizations. How do we do that? So that's the next PNPM is trying to do that. So there are ways of doing this and make a lot more sense that constantly are both aware of and interact with organic systems, right? And that's the way it, ne it needs to be done. And constantly, again, with experimentation. Uh, so you're absolutely right, right? Uh, what doesn't work is, is, is you know, cookie cutter uh, uh, induced, uh, which has worked in Indonesia. Now uh, let's take it to God knows Kenya. It is. It absolutely is. Scott Guggenheim is an unusual guy. KDP is an unusual project. But you know that that's what. But, but it is. And what a lot of what we know about the about community development at the bank is from Indonesia on the best project possible. That's part of the nature of. I mean, think of our results, right? We're looking at the econometric evidence. Now, which pro, in order to have like a JPAL type to go in and evaluate a project like this, that project that have enormous self-confidence. So what we're looking at is the cream, cream at the top. The best projects are the ones getting evaluated. And despite that, we're getting the results we get. So just, just keep that in mind, right? The vast majority of projects have no econometrician who's gone in there. They typically have what are, you know, consultants uh, going in and writing stuff that the project wants to hear, which is not an evaluation. Yeah, back. PID student. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering, like, a, a couple of the lessons you said, like taking context seriously, looking first at the problem and understanding the problem well, um, not just yeah, copy pasting solutions from other places. To me, seem like general lessons for, like, any like any development work. So uh, my question is a bit like, how much of what you think you learn is really particular to um, to this? this type of development rather than like general yeah. value. So, so the, the, the two answers to that, and that's a very good question. Um, first is you're right. It's general lessons. I mean, a lot of what we're saying are general lessons. But in what we call complex interventions, and all participatory interventions are complex interventions. What is a complex intervention? One that has more heterogeneity. But heterogeneity matters a lot more. Every village is different. These things become even more important, point one. Yeah? And that's, so, so it matters for everything, but matters much more for us, for our stuff. The second point, the flip side of that, is that participation helps, can help everywhere. I mean, so what do we mean by participation? So as I said, to answer Peter's question, I mean, if you have a road project, or let's say you have a schools project, I mean, the evidence is clear. This is a school and health project. The evidence is clear. If you have village committees, a parent-teacher association monitoring the school, the school does better. That level of participation where the sandwich has already happened, why, is, why do we find better results in health and education because the sandwich has happened. The Ministry of Education, and that answers Peter's question, has accepted the idea of participation in that ministry's work. So it's going to listen to whatever the school committee at the village is going to say and provide the resources to enable it to happen. Right? So even if the governments are completely failed, so long as the Ministry of Education works fine, you can do participation, and it will help. Right? So participation has a much broader relevance uh, than simply sort of community-based development or, or decentralization. And that's the other point we want to make. Right? And that maybe requires less monitoring, because that's just information that's just you know, controlled for, for an existing project. A dams project, build a big dam, resettlement. Uh, you need to have participatory systems of negotiation, of deliberative systems to figure out how do we resettle people. But that's messy, so they don't do it. Oh, they, they're supposed to do it, but they don't do it really well, you know, because it creates noise. And, and, and bureaucracies don't like noise. Hi, I'm Graham Smith um, at the Ash Centre and also Centre for the Study of Democracy in Westminster. I have a range of questions to ask, but I guess one that I'm um, particularly interested in is the question of design. Um, and I tried to do some work a while back trying to understand the, the nature of participatory appraisal, which I, you know, has some, some sort of uh, family resemblance here. And what I found by looking at World Bank documents was how little I could actually tell about what had been done. And so when you're, you know, and I'm just wondering, I guess the same is here. I mean, actually, how much lessons can you draw from these reports on the design characteristics that work of actual, you know, participatory institutions? Because from what I've seen, there's actually the, the level of detail uh, of what people have done in the field is so scant. 
they say, oh, we did a participatory appraisal. How? Yeah. When? And I, and I, and I wonder where... So I think you're right. I think design matters, context matters. But we seem to be a long way away from really being able to account for design. Yeah, no, and that's that's a good question. So so two points. I mean, participatory appraisals. Understand what participatory appraisals are, right? I mean, I'm not I'm not making this up. Um, am I being videotaped? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so participatory appraisal is basically, firstly, very small sample. Yeah, a bunch of consultants go in, talk to a few people in the village that they call you know, qualitative work, but it's actually focus groups of some basic kind. I mean, they do a song and dance before it and call it participatory, but it's basically a focus group. And they do it quickly. Uh, they come up with results. So when you go to a village and you ask the local facilitator to organize groups for you, who are they going to go to? People who benefited from the project, usually the elites. right? So you're always going to find good stuff. There's going to be no variation. Participatory appraisals rarely give you problems. They always give you good things, right? because that's the nature of the beast. That's how it's done. right? The results we draw on are quite different. They're large-scale survey-based econometric work right? done by independent researchers who have then had those papers published, refereed in top journals. Right? So it's not gray literature. This is serious academic literature, right? point one. It's been vetted and established. Secondly, because you, you, it has a credible counterfactual, if not a randomized trial, then some sort of regression discontinuity, purpose is co-matching, something that is considered relatively credible. It, it is looking at both treatment and control over time, usually with two rounds, baseline and follow-up, on a large scale. So the nature of the evidence is far better because it's much bigger scale and, uh, and also sort of more econometrically, statistically valid. Right? Okay. So there's a big difference between the evidence we look at and that kind of evidence, point one. But your point is right. No, well, in our book, our understanding of design comes from the design document. We have looked, read carefully these crazy, very boring design documents, 350 of them, right? That's where I understand. And then from what are called ICRs, implementation completion reports, which is you know the independent evaluation group of the bank goes in and assesses these things. They write the reports. We look at those as well. That's the data we have, but that's the nature of the beast. What the literature lacks profoundly is qual good qualitative work. Right? You have this econometric stuff. I mean, that's a lit, it's a cross lit problem with the whole literature of development right now. You have all this econometric work that is not tied in with good ethnographic work telling you why you got a particular result or why you didn't. You get the result at the end, which is pretty credible, but we don't know why, how we got there. Right? And that's, we don't have that data. We don't have that evidence. You're quite right about that. And so the nitty gritty of what goes on, you have to go to anthropological work that may not be in the same project even, and then draw inferences, because you know, these mechanisms are pretty similar. So we look at the work of all these development anthropologists done wonderful work, and some of the work we've also done, trying to draw on that stuff, that kind of material. So that's, that's the nature of this book, the yeah, nature of the evidence. Yes? Dan Honig, I'm uh, in the PhD program here at the Kennedy School. And uh, I have two questions. Uh, you've talked quite a bit about how uh, the bank... Oh, Dan, I know you, don't I? Yes, OK, absolutely. sorry. <laughs> you have good on a beard or something. OK, yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's... Uh, so I have two questions. Uh, the first is, um, you know, you've talked quite a bit about how uh, the bank and other donors manage and design these projects and deliver these projects. Um, I was wondering if you... So what I'm hearing is that with regards to M&E systems, with regards to the incentives that facilitators are given, and there are opportunities for feedback uh, with regards to the project cycles that in which the bank tries to deliver these projects um, and the attention and sort of priority the bank gives. Uh, there are kind of, on the organizational level, opportunities ref for reform. Uh, I was wondering if you would add to that menu at all uh, other ways you think that the bank organizationally might shift how they deliver these projects. Um, and then my second question would be, uh, looking across donors who deliver participatory projects, do you think there are some that uh, do a better or a less oh, good, good job question. doing so? And uh, if so, why? Good questions. So on the first thing, look, incentives have to change. Okay? And I can't do that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm beyond my pay grade. You know? The organizational incentives have to change in every development agency. That's a big deal. Now, the bank is going through a big reorganization right now that's supposed to change those incentives. We'll see if that happens, right? Uh, you know, at least they're giving some thought to it, which is a good thing, right? So at the moment, we don't have any evidence as to whether it works or doesn't work. I don't know. It's just starting. But secondly, what can we do in that context? So let me tell you, I mean, I, I tell you what I'm trying to do, right? So when I finished the book, first draft of the book, it was back in 2000, late, early 2011, 
the vice president of the South Asia region, uh, who happens to be Mike Walton's wife, <laughs> uh, you know, said, okay, put up or shut up. You're sitting around writing all this stuff, go fix it. I got this big $5 billion portfolio of participatory projects in India, go fix them. Right? So that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half years. Uh, yeah? And what I've been trying to do is develop something that I call a social observatory. So what we do is that, I mean, it's basically bringing research to operations, but embedding research within operations. So it's not like a researcher going from the outside and doing stuff. We all, I mean, that's why I spent six months a year in India. We work from within these projects. And we do, we've got about 20 impact evaluations going on. That's one thing, right? But then we're doing qualitative work. We're doing something called process monitoring. We sort of got all these projects tracked on, on a rotating random sample on qualitatively to understand you know, problems of implementation. Uh, I've got in-depth qualitative work going on in two or three different places tied in with the econometric work. Uh, case studies. Yeah? Uh, every time the qu sort of quick thing needs to be done, we get case studies done. We did a big case study on the implementation of the largest Indian uh, participatory program, the National Rural Livelihoods Mission, and found lots of problems uh, that we presented back to them and resulted in a reorganization of that project. Right? Uh, uh, I've just now done a case study, uh, somebody works with me, done a case study on a mental health, participatory mental health intervention that found all kinds of design issues that they're trying to fix. Right? So we're changing, trying to change the culture of these projects, revealing the mess. And by the way, we're finding a lot of good stuff. That's what's surprising. If you let people, good researchers in, and it's not just me, it's I mean, the people from all over the world working on this stuff you know, under our umbrella, we're finding a lot of good stuff. These projects actually do a lot of good, you know, and they also have lots of problems. But that openness to accepting the good with the bad is what is different, okay, because of this constant engagement. Right? Uh, and that, to me, is very healthy. Because every, every project scrutinized at that level is going to have that thing going on. Yeah? Uh, now, if that can happen everywhere, Okay? And, and there's no reason why not. There are lots of MPID people who could go and work on these things, uh, lots of PhDs. Uh, I, think, I think it could make a difference. Right? You need that constant engagement. And by the way, there's some really good research to be done here. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, so um, I'm Julian from the um, Program of Criminal Justice at the Kennedy School. Um, I'm curious to know um, what you learned from uh, the relationship between um, induced participation projects uh, and uh, political goals and, and, uh, and ambitions, whether at the local or national level. Because uh, um, I think one of the lessons you drew is that, um, I mean, you'd like uh, the World Bank projects in the future to take into account a little bit more um, social and political analysis and not just economic analysis. So, but I'm curious to know what, what it means. Um, does it mean that you, you actually learned through your, your careful review of these projects in the past that um, would have been a good thing to actually tie the projects to current local um, or national, you know, government ambitions, or does it mean something else? Yeah. So, I mean, so by, by political analysis, I don't mean that we, we need to be aligned with politics. I mean, the projects are already terribly aligned with politics because they have to be approved by the politicians, <laughs> right? So they're going to do what's in their interest to do. And in fact, you find some results that show uh, that these projects are more likely to be implemented just before a big national election. It's an easy way to send money down to the ground. You know? um, so, I mean, that's, 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 that's another story. That's not what we mean by political analysis. <laughs> that's done, right? What we really mean is being aware of systems of exclusion, of being aware of how local politics work in villages generally in, in that country or in municipalities generally in that country. How do political parties actually function okay? at the local level? We're talking about local projects here. Yeah? Uh, how, does, how, does, how do national politicians, so, so one big issue with, with any kind of participatory intervention is this sort of pendulum thing, you know. Uh, you have periods when countries love decentralization, when they hate decentralization, right. So which end of the pendulum are we right now? Is, is that, and is that going to change uh, when the next election comes rolling along? Uh, is it worth investing in this participatory project right now? Or in other words, how do we protect the participatory intervention from a pendulum swing at the other end? How do we do that, right? These are, these are, and there are a variety of questions like that. Social stuff is, of course, easier to think about. I mean, the systems of exclusion, system of, what is the nature of gender exclusion? How do we change that? How do we fix that? That kind of thing. I mean, you have something called gender analysis nowadays, which always comes up with the same thing. Women are much worse off than men. Let's have reservations. I mean, that's basically all you say, which is not a bad thing, but you could do a lot more complex stuff than that. Yeah? Uh, so so I, the point we're making is that, you know, just bringing historians, political scientists, anthropologists into the dialogue of the design 
would make a big difference. Knowledgeable historians, anthropologists, political scientists, right? People who actually know something about what's going on on the ground. That rarely happens. That's the point. You have decontextualized project design right now. That's the problem. Right? So we're talking very, very simple stuff. Yes. Um, I'm Julie Weaver. I'm a PhD student in the government department. Um, so building on a couple of the questions that had to do with this idea that there's perhaps you know these certain characteristics of communities in which this type of initiative works better. So for example, you know less unequal or a strong state, these sorts of things. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about you, your perspective. Basically, was that that doesn't mean that you shouldn't go into these sorts of communities. Um, and you can kind of imagine that there would be sort of a feedback loop. Whereas if these sorts of initiatives are working effectively in terms of reducing inequality, then that sort of feedbacks in, feeds back in, and then they're working even more effectively. And so I'm just wondering, you know, is that something that you've been able to uncover? Yeah. And 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 in particular what seem to be the sorts of mechanisms and project design elements that made something like that possible? So, yeah, that's a good question. So, so, so smart projects, projects that understand the nature of uncertain trajectories always have a program of change, right? That for the first five years you'll do this, when things change, there's gonna be a sequence to where we proceed to the next thing. And think that's when maybe shift as they go along. Arkan, what do you call it? Uh, there's a word you use that I forget now. Anyway, uh, I mean, it's, 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 about, it's about understanding the trajectory of change in theory, and then thinking about project design along those lines. So you may have three to five year project cycles, but then they think about what you're, going to do, what you're going to be doing after that three to five years in the next project. How are we going to move that? And there are projects that do this. There are projects that go to the second phase, go to the third phase, and change up Jamaica, uh, the Jamaican gentleman has left. Uh, JSEF, you know, Jamaica Social Investment Fund was one example of this, and it's a very interesting project. The project was designed on the basis of something that Norman Manley had done in the 1960s, you know, the Jamaica Social Welfare Society. And they started the social fund building on all these old men, Daji men, who were all social activists back in their 20s, but now in their 60s, okay? And they were now pastors, they were school teachers, they were retired, you know, government officials, all living in villages around the country. And they became the activists to develop this new project, right? And they had mixed results, but then now they're in JSEF 4 or something, and it's become this national phenomenon. And it kind of, you know, and, and, you know, done all kinds of interesting things, you know, tried to deal with the whole drug issue, the violence issue. That's, the, and, and, you know, not enough research has been done to see whether it's been an effective intervention or not, but that's the kind of trajectory that I would be talking about, right? So it can be done. The, the issue is that it's not done enough. It's not given enough thought. I wanted to raise a question that steps back and then um, kind of takes off of your, I was taken by your, the, your inter introductory history of the pendulum swing of yeah. development, you know, from the a participatory moment in the 50s and 60s to a highly, highly centralized big capital project moment for uh, a couple of decades, maybe three decades, and then maybe a participatory moment after that. And then those, so the question is maybe as a organizational sociologist of the organization that you're in and having looked at a bunch of aid agencies, Maybe it's the case, I hope this isn't true, but it may be the case that the things you're asking for are exactly the right things to do, but too hard for any bureaucracy to contemplate in terms of the degree of candor and self-criticism that it would require, in terms of the commitment of timeline that it would require, right? And then the sheer complexity, right? It's easy, you know, uh, Peter Evans has this great article on institutional monocropping yeah. in development history, right? You know, the, the piece that, you know, development is taken by very simple ideas of which participation is one, of which capital accumulation was another, right? And then here comes Bijou along telling us exactly how complicated and nuanced the business of participation really is. And then a bunch of people throw up their hands and say, we're not going to do that. We need something simple. We need something that a technician can implement. And we need to have certainty in that. right? And then, so we're going to go for a number of uh, a grab bag of technical solutions of which uh, we rely, of which, on which the premium is verification. So they have to be randomized. They have to be simple. They have to actually not require participation. They have to be on the order of a deworming pill or a mosquito net that has big impact that I can have a lot of confidence in. But there's very simple. Maybe the randomized mosquito net is the big dam of the next 10 years. You know, if you go down the street to JPAL, that's what they'll tell you. 
Uh, in fact, I've had arguments with Abhijit about precisely this point, and that's his point of view. If I'm, I, I think, paraphrase, that's his point of view, uh, and it's a respectable point of view, right? Uh, and maybe how bureaucracies, how development bureaucracies work, just favors that. That 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 is a respectable point of view. Now, <laughs> now, 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 let me let me give you the counter <laughs> argument. All right, right, give me give me the hope. <laughs> the two counter arguments. Firstly. And you know, we try to give some thought to, the, to this in the book about within existing structures, how do we make participatory interventions more effective? Right? Now, I told you what I was trying to do in India. That's, I'm doing that right now under, these, under this structure. It can happen. Okay, I'm not saying I've, I've made a magical change happen, <laughs> but at least I think the projects are getting a little more serious about taking data seriously. And by the way, the random easters are helping in that process sure. because they're the ones who are kind of doing this impact evaluation stuff that sort of, you know, and that which people are thinking is very sexy nowadays. Is there's a huge, huge effort to improve impact evaluations everywhere, which is getting me money to do the kinds of things I want to do, right? So yes, I do a lot of impact evaluations, but I also do a lot of other stuff. And that is really changing things on the ground. That's happening right now. And it's making these projects a lot better. Does that answer Peter Hall's question about do we, what do we do when the, everything fails? Um, I don't know, right? But it certainly can't hurt. Right? Yeah. That's one point. So within that intersection of the, the bureaucratic, the organizational sociology, so on, what is the space for better participation? That's point one. And related to that is your earlier point of organic. Right? Understanding how organic stuff works in these countries and building on that organic, scaling it up, using these ideas in mind, that has happened and can happen. Right? And thirdly, just regular old participation in the sense of consultation. When you're do building a big dam, when you're, that, why can't you do that? I mean, that's kind of baby stuff, right? That's easily done. And, and just not, people don't put effort into it. That can happen as well. Now, there may be politically sensitive mining project benefit sharing, right? Uh, they call that participation, but it's, you know, very, very often very difficult to implement. That's very difficult to do. But there are other places, schooling project, easy to do. You know, why don't do it? And people are doing it more and more. So I don't think that it's, it's an either or. I think there is a space for participation within that space. We have to think hard about what that space is and how to do it, right? Democratic participation, deliberative democracy, all that good stuff. We need a lot of things coming into place before we start pushing that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, Empowered participatory governance. <laughs> <laughs> well, th that's fantastic. I wish we had more opportunities to have this kind of discussion that ranges all the way from the very, very operational to the historical and deeply conceptual. So thank you very much. Peter. Thanks very much. Thanks for your question.